Bonjour tout le monde, comment ça va? And welcome to this video. It's that time again as we're going to go in depth talking about the inner workings of one language. Today, that language is French. I've already made one video about French a while back, talking about why its orthography isn't nearly as bad as that of English. In that video's introduction, I promised that that video wasn't taking the place of a French language overview, and so here's the real thing, as foretold. Let's go! First off, let's look into the origins of the language. French, or Francais, is a Gallo-Romance language in the Indo-European language family. French is definitely one of the more innovative Romance languages, which is a result of its history involving a lot of outside influence. What's now France was first annexed by the Romans in about 125 BC, or at least the South was at that time. This dialect of Vulgar Latin underwent some influence from Gaulish, the Celtic language already spoken there. After the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 AD through the 8th century, Gaul slash France got invaded many times and ruled by a Germanic group known as the Franks, who lent their name to the country. The Frankish language had a profound impact on French, especially in terms of pronunciation and about 15% of modern French vocabulary. Afterwards, we enter the Old French period, which was between the 700s and the 1300s. Old French developed from the dialect spoken in the north, known as Languedoc, as opposed to the Languedoc spoken in southern France. Then came the transitional Middle French period between the 1300s and 1500s. Everything since then is considered modern French. In that time period, the language got standardized to the Paris variety and then spread through various means such as colonization overseas and particularly draconian education tactics within France in areas where minority languages are spoken. Throughout these centuries, French has enjoyed a very high status as a language of prestige and the international language of diplomacy. Today, French is an official language in 29 countries and 12 subnational entities spread throughout most of the world. It has about 80 million native speakers with about 187 million L2 speakers totaling approximately 267 million total speakers. French ranks 15th in the world for native speakers and 7th in the world for total speakers. Now let's see a bit about French phonology. In terms of phonemes, French has 14 vowels and 20 consonants totaling 34 phonemes. First about the consonants. For rare consonant phonemes, French has two, the voiced labia palatal approximate y and the voiced uvular fricative r. That sound has an allophone as well. It gets devoiced when following a voiceless pulsive or fricative like in frère and fenêtre. Now onto vowels. You may have noticed that French has an abnormally large amount of vowels for a Romance language. This is due to its Germanic influence as well as nasals. Three of French's 14 vowels are nasal, meaning that some of the sound from the vocal cords comes out through the nose. These encounters rare phonemes in their un, 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 un. French vowels are non-reductive and the stress is always on the last syllable. This is all I have to say about phonology alone. Due to its linguistic history, French is a language where pure modern allophones are hard to come by due to a lot of complex historical sound changes, and it's much more apt to talk about it in terms of morphophonology, or, as I'm about to do, to talk about the phonology and orthography together. So now here's the part about French orthography, and you'll see a lot of historical sound changes in allophones within it. French uses its own version of the Latin alphabet with officially 26 letters, although that number shrinks to 24 if you only count letters occurring in native French words, as K and W are only found in loanwords. Of those 24 letters, there are 5 vowels, 18 consonants, and 1 letter that can be either. By now you've noticed 24 letters, but 34 phonemes, what will French do about it? French makes heavy use of digraphs and even trigraphs, especially in vowels. In consonants, the digraphs are ch as sh, ph as f, and gn as ny. In vowels, there are a lot of multigraphs, which make up for French's deficit of vowel characters for phonemes. To say it as efficiently as possible, oe is pronounced ou, oe is pronounced wa, ue is pronounced ui. These combinations are pronounced e, and these combinations are pronounced o. There's also this combination, and it's pronounced e, which is the same way that just e is pronounced, while e is pronounced e. Now on to matters that affect both consonants and vowels, starting with one of the most famous parts of French orthography, the silent final letters. To start, the highlighted letters are usually silent at the end of the word, with no effects on the preceding vowels, like crapaud and le. If a word ends with m or n, or the digraph ng, then it's silent, but the vowel before it is nasalized, like mouton and sang. R is actually most commonly not silent at the end, but if E is before it, then that E R unit is often pronounced E like Evie. Speaking of E, it's a vowel, but it's also silent at the ends of words. As well, a combination of E S at the end of a word is also silent. We'll talk more about this in the grammar sections, but the role that E takes in final position orthographically is often to make the consonant before it pronounced rather than silent. Historically speaking, final E was A before getting reduced and deleted throughout the evolution of French, which is why it's important even if silent. Unlike E S, E plus any other consonant is not silent like poulet. Since we're back to silent final consonants, might as well talk about liaison now. You ever wonder why French doesn't just quit writing the silent consonants? It's because they can still sometimes be pronounced. Specifically, when the following word begins with a vowel, most silent letters are actually pronounced like in les oies or ison. 
Should be mentioned, S, X, and Z all get pronounced Z during les ans. Unfortunately, not all words with silent final letters make them reemerge. As mentioned in the previous video about French, I learned in French class, to my surprise, that the P at the end of l'eau doesn't do liaison and that for those words there's no system. If you're actively learning French and want to know the specifics, follow the link in the description to the page that Lawless French has about this. One of these situations, however, is when the following word starts with H aspiré. What happened here is that when evolving from Vulgar Latin, some words had H on the beginning, but these became silent well before Old French. Then, when Germanic words starting with H were added to French, they kept pronouncing their H until early modern French. However, in the 1400s, the aforementioned silent final letters had, well, become silent, giving birth to the concept of liaison. At this time, the Romance ash words started with a vowel, so they were affected by liaison, but the Germanic ash words still started with H, so they didn't take liaison. When the Germanic ashes became silent, they weren't retrofitted with liaison, so they remained unaffected. And that's the story behind the general pattern of Romance words having H mué and Germanic words having H aspiré. There are some exceptions though. For exceptions to silent letters overall, go to the other Lawless French link in the description box. Finally, for the orthography, let's discuss French diacritics. French orthography employs a wide range of diacritics for various purposes. First, the acute or l'accent aigu only appears on e and indicates that the letter is pronounced e rather than e or silent. Along similar lines, the grave or l'accent grave is put above e to indicate a pronunciation of e. However, the grave is also put above a and e with the purpose of disambiguating between two words that would otherwise be spelled the same. Here are the examples as well as the word déjà which just has it because its etymological component word ja was spelled with it. Moving on, the circumflex or l'accent circumflex is put over any vowel to indicate that a letter, often s, used to be there, like in these examples. However, it could also represent a now gone vowel, especially if it's there for disambiguation. Finishing off vowel diacritics, the diaresis or le tréma is put on the second vowel of a pair to indicate that they are pronounced separately and not as a digraph. A good example is this word, which is pronounced naïf and not nef, which is how it would be pronounced without the diuresis. It's also put in the u in jue word final sets to indicate that the u is pronounced as jue would normally be said as just the final g, since the je ending is read as j. Couldn't find a place to mention this earlier, but yeah, c and j stuff. C is rather than que, and j is j rather than que when before e, i, or y. To negate this, i is inserted after j, and c is changed to qi. And this leads perfectly to the last diacritic, the cedilla or la cedi, is attached under a c to indicate that it's pronounced s despite not being before e, i, or y, like in garçon. It would be logical to also put a cedilla on j, but instead they just insert a sign in e. We are finally through French's ridiculously complicated orthography. Psych! There's some fairly common words that we need to look at because they don't follow all the aforementioned rules. To start, the words for son and daughter both look like they should be pronounced fil, but neither of them is actually pronounced that way. The word for son is fils, and the word for daughter is fi. Also, these numbers are pronounced six and dix, and this is pronounced huit. No silent letters. Now that we're finally beyond the orthography for real this time, time to start French grammar off with the sentence structure. French is overall an SVO language, however, object pronouns often precede their verbs breaking this rule. This specifically with conjunctive object pronouns, which we'll learn more about in the pronouns section. For an example, le chat chasse la souris. This means the cat hunts the mouse, or the cat is hunting the mouse. Word for word, we have definite article, noun, verb, definite article, noun, SVO. However, if we were to replace souris with a pronoun, the sentence would be le chat la chasse. That sense appears to be SOV due to the pronoun going before the verb. La in this situation is a pronoun, not an article like it was in the first sentence. To make it less confusing, I'll alter the sentence a little bit to le chat me chasse, the cat hunts me. Still SOV in that scenario. Keep in mind, this only applies to conjunctive pronouns. When the disjunctive pronouns need to be used, mainly with imperative verbs, they still follow the verb. Other stuff about sentence structure, prepositions go before their nouns, and adjectives generally go after their nouns, unless the adjective is short and common, in which case it may go before. Also, unlike other Romance languages, French is anti-drop, meaning you can't drop the subject pronoun. Finally for this, questions in French can be tricky. The more formal way would be to make the sentence VSO and add a dash, like in sais tu danser? Do you know how to dance? But the more common way these days is est-ce que tu sais danser? Which literally means, is it that you know how to dance? The question what's that is even weirder, for that you would say, qu'est-ce que c'est? Which literally means, what is it that it is? Let that sink in. Now for something which made a brief appearance in the last section, the articles. For the basic articles, French has eight total in three sets, those being definite, indefinite, and partitive. First off, the definite articles. There are three of them, being masculine singular le, feminine singular la, and non-gender plural les, which is a common participant in liaison. There are also two indefinite articles, being masculine un and feminine in, with no plural forms. 
That role is taken on by the partitive articles, which roughly translate to some of. They're formed by mashing the preposition de with the corresponding definite article, forming du, de la, and des. One more thing, though. If a singular noun beginning with a vowel, or hmi, takes a definite or partitive article, regardless of gender, the article gets contracted to l and directly attaches the noun, such as in l'avocat and l'aigle, for partitive just add de beforehand. Let's talk about nouns now. As already spoiled in the article section, French nouns are split into two genders, masculine and feminine, and two numbers, singular and plural. The general rule is that feminine nouns add with e, like in bille and grenouille. This e is, of course, silent, and makes the consonant before it pronounced. However, despite ending with e, words ending with age are masculine, such as visage. In addition, nouns ending in t and yon are also feminine, like habileté and attention. Most masculine nouns otherwise don't have a special ending, such as requin and ciel. To pluralize most nouns, regardless of gender, add an s to the end of the word, like in chat to e, cha and chouette to, well, chouette. As might have gathered by now, that s is silent, but it will reappear, pronounced as z in liaison. The exceptional pattern to this rule is nouns that end with u, often in multigraphic sets like o or u, as they instead take x as their plural suffix, like in moino to moino and genou to genou. This difference is purely orthographic, by the way. It makes no difference whatsoever in spoken French. French has no noun cases whatsoever. Now let's talk about some personal pronouns. Here's the big chart of pronouns, and we'll first look at the subject pronouns. Some things to note, starting with on. This pronoun is a bit confusing because it's commonly translated as we, but is conjugated as third person singular. Why? Because its actually meaning is one, as in, one does not simply go to someone's house to ransack the fridge. But it's way more common than that, and when it is used as we, adjectives agreeing to it will be plural even though the verbs remain singular. The French honorific system works in a similar fashion. For more respect, instead of referring to one person with tu, you use vous. When you use vous in a singular honorific fashion, the verbs conjugate in second person plural, but the adjectives are singular. The last two things to know in this matter are that je becomes je in front of a vowel, and that all plural pronouns do liaison. Now we're on to the object pronouns, and it should be noted that there are two groups of them which I've put side by side. First, the conjunctive pronouns are used in situations where the object precedes the verb, namely direct and indirect objects. There's a difference in third person direct and indirect object pronouns, as direct is le or la in singular and les in plural, but lui and leur are the indirect objects in singular and plural respectively. There's also this third person pronoun, ce, which is reflexive. Disjunctive pronouns, being these, are used when after a preposition or an imperative verb. They're also used as the calling names for people, i.e. out of context pronouns, instead of the definite pronouns. Finally, possessive pronouns look like this, and they agree for gender and number, but be aware that the masculine forms will be used for singular pronouns if a feminine word begins with a vowel. And here's the number section. This will get a bit interesting. First off, unlike adjectives, numbers, both cardinal and ordinal, go before the noun. Only the number one, un or une, gets inflected for gender. Also, the presence of numbers does not affect the pluralization of their nouns. But the real fun happens in the tens. Ten through sixty are fairly normal, but then you count past that and you get sixty-eight, sixty-nine, sixty-ten, sixty-eleven, sixty-twelve, and then you count more and it's like sixty-eighteen, sixty-nineteen, four-twenty, four-twenty-one, four-twenty-two. Then later on, 42010, 42011, all the way up to 42019 before you get back to normal with 100 or 100. The Swiss and Belgian French dialects count normally, by the way, and they love making fun of other French speakers for that. Now that we're past the linguistic algebra, ordinal numbers are fairly simple. First is premier, but after that you just take the rest of the cardinal numbers and add yem to the end. Now it's time for the adjectives. French adjectives agree with their nouns in gender and number. The agreements are identical to how they work in the nouns. The plural morpheme is s, which is silent until liaison happens, you know the drill. In terms of orthography, masculine adjectives in French don't have a special ending, and to make them feminine, you add e at the end. This e, of course, makes any previously silent consonants at the end of the root pronounced, although be aware that the root may not end in a consonant like bleu or épicé, but the e still gets added. That being said, there are some adjectives like rapide whose masculine forms already end with e. They just stay like that in the feminine. For a general example, here's petit and its forms. As for some special cases, if the adjective ends with s, then the s gets doubled in the feminine, although not in the plural, like this example with gros. If the adjective ends with x, then it normally becomes s, not doubled in the feminine, and the masculine plural form is unchanged from the masculine singular, like délicieux here. A unique example is doux, which becomes douce with a c in the feminine. And if an adjective ends with er, then a grave will be added in the feminine just so that it fits standard French writing conventions. There are also exceptions like beau. Finally, to make an adverb, simply take the feminine singular form of the adjective and add mon, with the exception of bien, which means well. Here are some examples. Now you move on to verbs, which are a more complicated section in this video. French has three verb classes, those being er, ir, and re, based on infinitive suffixes, as well as some irregulars we'll talk about later. French verbs are divided into four moods, indicative, subjunctive, conditional, and imperative, as well as four tenses, present, future, and then the past is split into perfective and imperfective aspects, with some caveats. While well, French has a past tense called le passé simple, that tense is now obsolete and has been replaced with le passé composé. 
The composed past, as it translates to, is named that because it's composed of the appropriate form of avoir, meaning have, followed by the past participle of the action verb. This is used when the verb happened once or had a clearly defined start and end. Many languages in the standard average European Sprachbund have this composed past feature, but only those in a smaller Sprachbund involving French, Italian, and Swiss German use it as the main past tense form when not imperfective. Speaking of that, the imperfect tense, or l'imparfait as it's called, is used for continuous habits in the past. The present tense is for anything happening now or routinely these days, while the future tense is specifically for the far future. If you want to talk about the near future, you should use the appropriate present tense conjugation of aller, meaning go, followed by the action verb in infinitive form. Now about what the moods mean. The indicative is pretty straightforward, you're indicating what's happening. The subjunctive is used in subordinate clauses when you're unsure of something. Those sentences are formed with a verb in another mood, normally indicative, then the conjunction que, then the subjunctive verb. There are specific times to use the subjunctive you can look up, but just remember that it expresses doubt. The conditional expresses things that would happen under certain conditions, i.e. the would tense, and the imperative is used to tell people what to do. Now it is finally conjugation time. The regular verbs I'll be using to represent the verb classes will be trouver for the er verbs, choisir for the er verbs, and perdre for the er verbs. I should mention though that while the er class is by far the most common, the other two classes have high degrees of irregularity, so the selection for these verbs was a bit difficult. Anyway, let's start with the indicative mood, and here's the present tense of Look at the pronunciations, and it's easy to understand why French became anti-drop. Despite the spelling being largely unique for most of the forms, that's not what matters for grammar. If you're listening to French, four of the six forms are identical, and dropping the subject pronoun would be way too ambiguous. Notably, one of those is the third person plural form, trouve, which I had thought was pronounced differently until I actually took French class. So yes, this particular conjugation category, including in other tenses, has the e and t ending pronounced differently than it would be in any other situation in the language. Now here's choisir. Notice that instead of the first and third person singular forms being identical, here it's the first and second person singular forms. All the singular forms are still pronounced the same though. Now here's perdre with much of the same. Now onto the indicative imperfect conjugations, which are often taught as the easiest conjugations to make, even for irregular verbs, provided you've learned the present. You basically take the on off the present tense verb in first person plural, then attach one of these endings according to the person. So here's trouver, choisir, perdre. Now for the future tense, which is conjugated off the end of the infinitive rather than the root. Here's trouver, Choisir, perdre, but remember to drop the e off the end before doing the future conjugations. Now for the passé composé. As mentioned, you take the conjugated present tense form of avoir, shown here, and then the past participle of the action verb. Here are the regular formations of those. Something to remember, though, is that these participles are adjectives, and therefore they can get inflected for gender and number. This happens if they have an object preceding them in the sentence. In that situation, the participle will agree with the object in gender and number, such as in il a vu, he saw them. But that's only if avoir is being used anyway. In verbs that are either reflexive or intransitive, you would use être instead of avoir. And when you use être, the participle agrees to the gender and number of the subject. For an intransitive example of that, we have je suis venu à la fête. But if you're a girl, you'd say je suis venu à la fête. In terms of pronunciation, it doesn't matter until the participle ends in a consonant, like in the reflexive example, je me le suis dit. I told it to myself, or if you're a girl, je me suis dit. Class normally teach the intransitive side of this system using the acronym shown here. The composed tenses using avoir also extend to other tenses when they have the meanings that they would in other SAE languages, like when you had done something, will have done something, would have done something, etc. Anyway, onto the subjunctive conjugations. The subjunctive present is typically taught of the same way as the indicative imperfect, where you take the first person plural of the verb, drop on, and add the ending. For the subjunctive present is mostly the same as for the indicative present, except for nous in vous which are from the imperfect. So trouver looks like a crossover event between those two tenses in the subjunctive present. Choisir looks like this with a lot more s's and perdre actually has the de pronounced with the e at the end now. Where the s's really pile up though is in the subjunctive imperfect except for third person singular which has either an a or e with a circumflex on top followed by a t. There's no subjunctive future. As mentioned in the Spanish overview, you'll have to wait for Portuguese for that to get discussed. Conjugating the conditional mood is much like the indicative future. You start from the infinitive, but the suffixes are different. They're basically the imperfect endings. Here's what they look like for trouver, choisir, perdre. Finally, there are only three conjugations for each verb in the imperative mood, those being second person singular and plural and first person plural, the let's form. And they're identical to their indicative present counterparts, except that the tu form sometimes loses its final s. Now I've seen the regular conjugations, so we need to talk about a few important irregular verbs. We've already talked a fair amount about avoir, so here it is. Its forms tend to be very short. Also, its participle forms are orthographic exceptions. They're pronounced u rather than e, not like most foreigners would notice. For other super common verbs, here's the most common of them all, être. It is super irregular, as expected, and has various forms starting with e, s, and f. Aller is also super common and irregular, although not nearly to the same degree as être. It has irregularities mainly in the present tenses future and conditional. 
It's pretty much the same story with voir, but the forms look different. Notice when the E changes to Y, it's when a vowel comes after it. Speaking of voir, verbs ending in voir also tend to be very irregular, like savoir, pouvoir, and, okay, I'm cheating a little, vouloir, which I'm including because it looks a lot like pouvoir. All three are irregular pretty much everywhere except the imperfect, and they get a lot chopped off the end in several conjugations. Connaître is also irregular pretty much everywhere, but for it, the regular spots are the future and conditional. As for less irregular irregulars, there's the squadron of verbs that end in tir, like partir, sentir, sortir, and also dormir. They're all mostly regular, except that the ends get chopped off in three indicative present forms. Now that we had that breath of fresh air, on to dire, which is irregular in most places except where that last set was, and also the future and conditional. Ouvrir mainly just has a weird past participle. Finally, there's falloir, which is a defective verb only conjugated with id, meaning like, it must be done. It's most commonly said as il faut, but here are the rest of its forms. Hopefully that's barely enough to cover most of French's irregular patterns. But before leaving the verb section, negation is also a bit weird. You put ne before the verb and pas after it, unless a word like personne or rien is in the sentence. For the anything important that didn't fit in the previous section segment now, we have to talk about French's two adverbial pronouns, i and en. Both of them basically act as fillers if there's something missing that you have to include in the sentence. For instance, if your friend asks you, est-ce que tu viens à la fête? Are you coming to the party? You can't just say, oui, je vais, yeah, I'm going, because according to French grammar, you left out your destination. So instead, you have to say, oui, j'y vais, yeah, I'm going there. That's a grammatical sentence. Starting with E, it represents destinations or locations, and you just saw an example sentence. Another common phrase with it is there is, or il y a, often shortened to ya. En, on the other hand, is the opposite. It describes coming from things. It's mainly the counterpart of de, meaning of or from. Some examples of it are on en parle, we're talking about it, je m'en vais, I go away from here, and elle en achètera cinq, she'll buy five of them. Additionally, if on is involved in a subordinate clause, then it gets replaced by don, like in Voici la chose dont on parle. Another miscellaneous topic to mention is that the conjunction that has two words in French depending on subject versus object. Those words are que and qui. Que is used when either connecting clauses or when connecting an object to the verb, such as Voici le cadeau qu'elle m'a donné. Qui, which is also the word for who, is used when connecting a subject to a verb, like in Il est le chien qui est à Paris sur la scène. Qui doesn't allied, by the way. Speaking of elision, we should address it. Elision is when words combine with an apostrophe, and we saw some of it in the articles. As far as written French goes, this generally happens when the first word ends with e, uh, and the second word begins with a vowel. Unless, of course, that respire is there. Here are the usual suspects, and you'll see quite a bit in the example sentences. That's just written French, though. In spoken French, or transcriptions of it, elision is much more widespread, and the rule is basically just however you can shorten your sentences. Here are two song titles that exemplify this. Papa Oute, which is one of the most famous French language songs of recent years, isn't actually one word. It's three, those being Papa Oute meaning, Dad, where are you? Yeah, if you know the lyrics, it's really sad. But to our point, there's a lesion with the word du, despite it not ending with e. The other song is je me tire, and it's also pretty sad. I listen to more uplifting stuff in French as well, I promise. But it smashes together the words je me, even with the latter starting with a consonant. So there's a lesion. Also, it's not a lesion, but a combines with le and le as o and o. Now I've reached the example sentences. First one is, Qu'est-ce que tu fais lorsqu'on n'est pas ensemble? This means, what do you do when we're not together? First, there's qu'est-ce que, the overcomplicated interrogative particle. Then tu indicates that this is an informal conversation, and fait is the conjugation of faire in the indicative present. Faire happens to be one of the highly irregular verbs I didn't talk about. Lorsque means when, and it elides. On, in this case, means we, but it's conjugated with e, and ne pas is how you negate that clause. Also, notice the liaison on pas ensemble. Finally, ensemble means together, and it has the plural suffix to on meaning we in this instance. The other example sentence is, Personne n'a vu le loup jaune dans cette grande forêt. This means, no one saw the yellow wolf in this big forest. First off, personne means no one, and because it's there, the word pas gets omitted from the sentence. The only negative marker here is ne, which elides with the a in a vu, which is voir si in the passé composé. Next, there's the masculine singular definite article le for the masculine noun loup, which means wolf. Next, jaune ends with e. Despite being masculine because it just always does, it's one of the adjectives that doesn't get inflected for gender. Dans means in, and set means this in feminine singular. Grande is a word for big in feminine singular, and it actually precedes the noun because it's common. Finally, forêt is the feminine noun meaning forest. Yes, it's an exception since it's feminine, but it doesn't end with e. For some closing thoughts, la langue française s'est très changée pendant les 1900 ans passés de son évolution. Elle est une nouvelle langue qui n'apparaît rien comme ses parents, 
mais elle a aussi réussi à maintenir des éléments de son passé. Beaucoup de gens pensent que c'est une manière d'augmenter la difficulté d'apprendre cette langue, mais sans ses caractéristiques comme la lison, l'illusion et toutes les lettres silencieuses, l'orthographe en reflèterait une imagination simplifiée et pas la belle réalité qui est très compliquée. Merci beaucoup de regarder et d'apprendre des lettres silencieuses et pourquoi elles y sont. Cliquez sur j'aime si c'est le cas et abonnez-vous et cliquez sur la cloche pour être informé lorsque je télécharge des nouvelles vidéos. Au revoir